Hello, this is Ed Chapman, and this video cast is going to illustrate the difference between divergent and convergent evolution. If you think about it, there are three things that an ancient species can do over evolutionary time. Um, for example, a parent species can split into two different species, and after the split, over time, the two new species, or daughter species, become more and more different from each other. So that means that if you looked at them, or looked at their fossil record, they would diverge or, or look more and more dissimilar. Another thing that could happen over evolutionary time is two unrelated ancient or parental species can evolve to look more and more alike. This is called convergent evolution, and in this case you're going to end up with two species, uh, for example in present day, that really strongly resemble each other. And this might lead you to think that they're related to each other, but that's not true. And finally, the third thing that could happen, which we're not really interested in today, is when the original species don't change much over time and pretty much retain their ancient or older characteristics through evolutionary time. So how does science know divergence from convergence? And the simple answer to this is you make some observations. Um, in science, observations are what form the basis of conclusions. And it's even better if these observations are repeatable or if they are reinforced by data coming from different sciences or from different directions. So the easiest way or the most important way to tell um, that divergent evolution has happened is to look for what we call homologies. Now homologies are structures that are inherited from the common ancestor that link two or more species together evolutionarily. So for example, um, we could have humans, mice, orangutans, and whales. These are all examples of mammals with hair. So that tells us that the common ancestor, the common mammal ancestor of these organisms, probably had hair. Because hair is a, is a trait or a feature that's been retained by all the descendant species of that original parent species. Um, I bet a lot of you did not know that whales actually possess hair-like structures uh, when they're when they're inside their mother before they're born. Um, I believe some, some species of dolphins, um, the unborn babies actually have a light fur coating for a little while, but then they shed it before they're born. And in this picture here, you can see the hair like baleen, which um, baleen whales use to filter um, their food from the water. Uh, this structure is actually related to hairs. So the genes that control hair were inherited by all the descendants of this original mammal um, ancestor of these um, five different species, or these four different species. So this means that humans, mice, orangutans, and whales all share a common mammalian ancestor based on the homology of hair. In general, homologous structures are structures that have the same parts, the same bones, for example, but are, are frequently used for different purposes. So if you compare here the forelimbs of humans, dogs, birds, and whales, you can see that the bones match up but over evolutionary time, they have evolved or adapted for different purposes. So we can say that humans, dogs, birds, and whales all share a common vertebrate ancestor. All right? Now, of course, birds are not mammals. They don't have hair, but they do share the same skeletal features as vertebrates, and we can see that in this picture. Now, of course, the reason why these structures have evolved to look different is because they have evolved or adapted to do different functions. For example, the forelimb of a human has been adapted for grasping. We no longer run on our forelimbs like a dog or a cat would. If you look at a dog or a cat, the second picture here, you can see that their forelimbs are used for running. A bird, I think, is the most dramatic example. Their forelimbs have evolved for a completely different way of getting around, flying. And uh, for whales, the front limbs or the forelimbs have become uh, stout flippers, where the bones have become very short and very um, thick, so they um, work better in water. So this adaptation over time is an example of divergent evolution from an original vertebrate ancestor to these four different examples that we have around us today. Um, this can be seen in an even more extreme example in the evolutionary um, theory of how we get whales. Um, the theory is that whales have evolved from walking, running mammalian ancestor, a walking, running mammalian ancestor. And over evolutionary time, this animal became more and more adapted for an aquatic existence. And if you're trying to catch prey in water, you need to be able to swim fast. And forelimbs just get in the way. So if you look in this progression, and these are all reconstructions from fossil evidence, we can see that these whale ancestors gradually lost their forelimbs, uh, excuse me, did not lose their forelimbs. Their forelimbs um, evolved into flippers as they became adapted for moving in water, 
and their hind limbs disappeared completely. So the evidence here supports the theory. Fossils show a gradual forelimb adaptation from leg to flipper, which supports the theory. Now, homologous structures can also become vestigial, which means they change so much that they become useless. Uh, but they do retain, they are retained in the body as evidence of an ancestor that did have a functional, um, dysfunctional part. Uh, for example, in humans, the very tip of our spine, which is called the cossacks, is a tiny little remnant of a tail. It doesn't help us or harm us in any way, unless you fall on it and break it, but it, it, it doesn't function as a tail any longer. So it's a vestigial example. It's an example of a vestigial structure in humans. Another example would be if you look in the skeletons of whales, you find pelvic bones. And these pelvic bones no longer attach to the spine or to legs. They're just leftover bones uh, documenting a history of a homology that once, that once connected these animals to land-living mammals that walked on four limbs. If you look at this snake, uh, some species of snakes still retain tiny little vestigial legs called spurs. I believe in some snakes they're only present in the male, um, no longer useful for walking. Uh, there may be a use in, um, in mating. You notice it's really close to where their tail joins their body, but these are tiny little um, vestigial evidence of ancestral hind legs. Uh, of course, snakes are, um, have evolved from lizards. And if we look at a lizard, yeah, this is, this is not a snake. You can see this, this legless lizard has tiny little front legs that really don't do much anymore. They're on their way to becoming vestigial. Uh, by the way, you can always tell a lizard from a snake because lizards have a neck and lizards also have an external opening to their ear. Um, snakes have lost this over evolutionary time. Now, divergent evolution is, as you can see in this picture, produces a branching tree-like um, line of descent for different species. So in this picture here, you can see the um, estimated dates in millions of years ago from where primates diverged into the living primates that we have today, uh, known as the great apes. There are five species of great apes uh, today running around, the orangutan, the gorilla, um, and two different types of chimpanzees. And we are on this tree, uh, we're most closely related to the chimps because we diverged from them the most recently. So homologies that we can use to compare all these primates are things that you only find in the mammals that fall into the taxon that we call primates. Things like opposable thumbs, a large brain compared to body size, uh, two eyes on the front of the skull, which gives us binocular vision, and a shoulder joint that allows us to rotate our arm or our shoulder cuff completely around 360 degrees, like in the motion a pitcher might make to throw a baseball. Uh, this is something that most mammals cannot do, especially things like dogs and cats. Their shoulder joints just don't move like that. So these homologies link us to other primates, and the fact that we have hair links us to other mammals, and the fact that we have forelimbs links us to other vertebrates. So you see how homologies work. Now, what about when species evolve to look more alike? Um, how do we sort these out? Because this might lead a casual observer to think two organisms that are not really related to each other actually are. So, convergence is when two parent species, which are not related, remember, evolve to look more alike. Uh, the simple answer to this question today is you just compare the DNA. Uh, you do um, the, that analysis of... Um, that you get from gel electrophoretic um, comparisons of DNA, and you can quickly see who's more closely related to who and who isn't related to who. But so note that the parents here are unrelated to each other, but we do get a situation where species can evolve to look alike. Um, the clearest example I can think of convergent evolution is the convergence of reptiles and mammals to the fish-like body shape for living in the water. Now, you may not be familiar with an ichthyosaur, but it actually is a type of reptile. It has descended from a land reptile, something similar to an iguana, and it's evolved a very fish-like shape. Um, in profile, it looks pretty much like a shark, but it is not a shark at all. It's not a fish. It is, a, is an air-breathing reptile. A similar situation has happened with the evolution of, of small whales called porpoises. They've evolved from a land mammal, like we saw earlier, and they have evolved towards a fish-like or shark-like shape, even though they are not sharks. They are mammals. Sharks, of course, are true fish with gills, and, and they um, get their oxygen from water. Ichthyosaurs and porpoises would have had to surface for, to take a breath of air, even though they look very fishy. So you got to be careful. Convergent evolution can produce... 
um, apparent homologies that can turn out to be false. So the fish-like body shape that we see here does not indicate common ancestry between these three creatures. Now, some examples of convergent evolution. Uh, nature is full of them. They're really kind of interesting. Uh, one of my favorites is the similarity in appearance between mole rats and true or real moles. If you look at these two animals, uh, both animals have adapted to digging in tunnels, a subterranean lifestyle, but they are descended from completely different ancestors. Excuse me, let me go back here. They're, they're, dis they're descended from different ancestors. The mole rat here at the top is actually a type of rodent, and the, the true mole on, in the lower picture is actually a type of insectivore. Their teeth are completely different if you look closely, but externally they look very similar. Another example from the plant world, um, the difference between succulents and true cacti. Uh, both of these plants have adapted to a desert lifestyle, but they are descended from different ancestors. Um, the one at the top is actually a true cactus. The one at the bottom is not a cactus, but the two look very much alike. And to an untrained eye, this example of convergent evolution might lead you to think that they're closely related, but they actually aren't. Um, another one of my favorites is the similarity between this marsupial and this placental. Uh, marsupials are mammals that carry their babies around in a pouch. Uh, placentals are mammals that give birth to their babies and then nurse them um, externally and carry them for a longer period of time. Uh, these two animals have adapted to be carnivores, but they're not really closely related mammals. They're descended from different ancestors. The thylacine is actually related to kangaroos. Its most close, close relative would be a kangaroo, whereas the dingo is actually a type of dog or a wolf-like creature. Um, they look very similar. They, live in, they used to live in the same places, but they are not closely related. Uh, unfortunately, the thylacine went extinct back in the 1930s. Um, the thylacine is kind of like the Bigfoot of Tasmania and New Zealand and even some parts of Australia. People swear people still see them, but no one has ever hit one with a car or caught one in a trap or taken a verifiable picture of one. So they probably really are extinct. So before DNA technology, convergent evolution made it appear to many early taxonomists that unrelated species were related to each other. Um, you probably all recognize the giant panda here on the left and the red panda on the right. Um, they're both named pandas. Um, they may even have been referred to as two types of bear at one point, but we now know today that the panda really is a bear and the red panda is actually a type of raccoon. It, it's in a different family of mammals. So altogether, Homologies are structures that are shared by two organisms that indicate or kind of uh, verify a common ancestry. Homologous structures can have very different functions like we saw in the forelimbs. Uh, vestigial structures are a type of homology where the structure no longer has a function today, but the fact that it's there is, is evidence of common ancestry to other organisms that still have that, that body part and it still has a function. Um, divergent evolution happens when ancestral species evolve into different species that look different from each other. And convergent evolution is what happens when two unrelated species, because of, of natural selection and adaptation to a similar environment, evolve to look more alike. Okay, so I hope that helped, and we will stop there.